today and this family in welcoming all of you who are visiting with us. Thank you very much for being with us uh, on this Lord's Day. This past Friday evening, we had a very enjoyable as well as encouraging, uplifting gospel singing. And uh, if there was ever an occasion to redeem the time, uh, it was this past uh, Friday evening. Uh, we had some wonderful spiritual singers there, people who are heavenly minded, spiritually minded, and wonderful spiritual singers. And uh, it was a great occasion of worship to God. And uh, on that note, I want to continue to emphasize the importance of such worship in our relationship to God and how it affects us individually and how it should motivate us then to serve the Lord in our daily lives. And so to, to carry on the theme of worship uh, this morning, would you study with me from the Old Testament book of Isaiah? It's in chapter six, please. Let's, let's look at some of the teaching of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter six in verse one. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty, exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Judah's 11th king was Uzziah. He reigned 52 long and prosperous years in Judah. For most of Uzziah's life, he was faithful to the Lord. He listened to the Lord's prophet at that time. The Lord's mouth or prophet was Zechariah. And Uzziah, uh, the king, Zechariah, the prophet, the priest, Azariah, all work together as God intended them to, in, in harmony, in unity, and fellowship, exalting and glorifying God according to his word. For most of Uzziah's life, that's the way it was. But as, as he got into his latter years, Uzziah was lifted up with pride. And he became so prideful in his latter years, at one point, he assumed the role of a priest and went into the holy place of the temple uh, in an attempt to offer incense as a priest. But there to meet him was Azariah and 80 priests whom the Lord says were valiant men. And they opposed Uzziah and they said, Uzziah, this is not for you. This is for the sons of Aaron. You need to get out of this place now. And he became very angry. But at that point, God struck Uzziah with leprosy on his forehead. And the Bible says Uzziah remained a leper until the day of his death. Now, what God did to Uzziah was actually very gracious because he could have taken the life of Uzziah. But instead, he gave Uzziah opportunity to humble his heart and repent of his sins. And we hope and trust that's exactly what he did. For most of his life, he was faithful to the Lord, and so Uzziah was a stabilizing, very strong influence in the nation of Judah. But by 740 BC, both Uzziah the king and Zechariah the prophet were dead. Now, what would become of the nation of Judah? Who would be their next ruler? Who would be their next prophet? Who would lead the nation through the ever-looming northern thread of, of the Assyrian Empire? Would justice or evil prevail in the nation? We're kind of going through a similar situation in our own country, aren't we, right now? We're wondering, will justice or evil prevail? Who will lead the nation? 
There's an ever looming threat from this person and that country. Well, in the midst of such great consternation, God reveals himself in this wondrous theophany to an Israelite by the name of Isaiah. And in this awesome theophany, there are three great lessons for us to learn about worship to God. Namely, worship begins first upward. Worship should always be inward. And it should then affect us to work outwardly. First and foremost, our worship is upward. True worship begins with humility and reverence toward God. Considering the incomprehensible greatness and power and wisdom of God. Let's look at Isaiah 6. Let's read verses 1 through 4 now. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. One called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. In this wondrous theophany, God lifted Isaiah's eyes from himself and the problems of Judah, the problems of his people to the throne of heaven. And Isaiah was allowed to look into the eternal realm, there enthroned in majestic glory, surrounded by heavenly dignitaries, was the true ruler of all the nations, all beings, all powers, the Lord of hosts. It was a soul-shaking vision, and it was desperately needed, just as it is today for us to think of things like this in our own troubled times. There might be confusion and unrest on earth at any given time period, but there's always a perfect peace and harmony in heaven. And the Lord is the true ruler of all. There was fear and weakness and doubt in Israel, but there was power and glory in heaven, and there still is. Hundreds of years later, in a very similar situation, in another very troubled time, in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, Revelation chapter 4, these are the words of God to his apostle John on behalf of the churches. Revelation chapter 4, beginning there at verse 1. And after these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me and said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like emerald in appearance. And around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. And from the throne proceed flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. In verse 8, we're told, the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they do not cease to say, holy, holy, holy. They were saying that 600 years earlier. They're still saying that. Holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. 
I want us to see, brothers and sisters, that even in heaven, with these very powerful heavenly beings who are always in the presence of God, these powerful heavenly beings that we can't even begin to comprehend are constantly awestruck by the greatness of God, so much that even they are incapable of adequately expressing his matchless glory. And so they do not cease to exclaim, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty who was, who was, who is, and who is to come. Brothers and sisters, we desperately need that sense, that sense of the surpassing holiness of God. Do we not? If heavenly beings far more powerful than we are recognize and extol God's surpassing greatness, how much should we, his earthly creation? I believe that's one of the main points here. If they're doing that in heaven, what should we be doing here on earth? We should be busy praising and extolling his holy name. The four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, do not cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. Not only praising God, but we see them humbly bowing before him in worship, in, in obeisance, and in homage. As Psalm 95 says, come let us bow before the Lord and worship him. And Habakkuk 2.20 says, Dempsey, there are times you need to shut your mouth and you need to be quiet and you need to listen because the Lord is in his holy temple and let all the earth keep silent before him. Sometimes we need to shut our mouths and just open our ears before the Lord God and listen. Listen. Worship is first and foremost upward. From man's perspective, worship is entirely about God. Worship begins with a recognition of God's incomprehensible greatness. And such an upward and honest acknowledgement of God helps us to see God as he truly is. But it also, it also helps us to see ourselves as we truly are. Worship is up, upward, but worship is also inward. Look back if, with me. Go back with me to Isaiah chapter 6. Let's continue the reading there in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5, please. Worship is upward, but worship must also be inward. It should inwardly affect us. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5, Then I said, Woe is me. This is Isaiah. Woe is me, for I am ruined. Another translation says, I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts. And so seeing these awesome heavenly sights, Isaiah's response was one of fear, humility, and shame. Isaiah immediately responded to this heavenly vision in a sense, or with a sense, of his own unworthiness. He said, woe is me, I am undone, I am unworthy. When I look at this situation here in Isaiah 6, I also think of Peter's response at the, the catch of the fish there at the Sea of Galilee. They had fished all night, and they had caught nothing. And Jesus nonetheless said, put your nets down, and Peter did. And upon putting the net down, there was such a catch of fish that the, the net could not contain all the fish. It was an obvious miracle, a sign from heaven. And you remember Peter's response to that miracle from heaven. 
he fell down in the boat in humble obeisance to Jesus, and he said, depart from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. It was the awesomeness of Jesus and the obvious power of Jesus that led to such a response, a humble and reverent response. Isaiah said, I am undone. I am unworthy. Now, along that line, brethren, when we fail to worship God, when we fail to worship God individually and collectively, as we do in assemblies such as this, we will lose that sense of respect and reverence. It, it's easy. When, you, when we don't worship God in occasions like this, we don't Listen to the Lord when he says, assemble together. I want you to come together, and I want you to sing, and I want you to pray together, and I want you to remember my son in this covenant supper. If we fail to do that over a period of time, what happens? Well, we fail, to, we fail in that we lose that sense of God's awesomeness. We need occasions like this. God knew that. And so he established local congregational families that could meet together, worship together, and remind one another of the incomprehensible glory and greatness of God. When we don't meet together, brethren, in occasions like this, over a period of time, we'll fall into a trap. And that trap is, instead of comparing ourselves to our creator and God, we'll begin to compare ourselves to one another. And we'll begin to measure our moral worth by one another rather than our creator and our God. Being in the presence of an absolutely sinless and holy being quickly will remove any foolish illusions of goodness based on merit or human comparison. Think of the songs we just sang. Our prayers this morning. They help bring us back to where we should be. What our place is, remembering who God is, who we are, and what our responsibility is to him while we're here. And so we sometimes feel like Peter, depart from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. We feel like Isaiah, he says, woe unto me, for I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips. I live among people of unclean lips. And Isaiah gives the reason as to what led to that response. He says, for my eyes have seen the King of the Lord of hosts. It was being in the presence of the Lord and seeing his awesomeness, as we seek to do in these songs and in these prayers and in our, our collective worship in ways God teaches. But if we're not worshiping God, and we're not with the people of God who love and worship him, we're not going to understand that. And we will soon lose that sense of who he is and who we are and what we're supposed to be doing. God is also merciful. And when Isaiah humbled his heart before the Almighty, verse 6 of Isaiah 6 says this, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. And he touched my mouth with it, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. In Luke 5, when Peter fell down and said, Lord, depart from me, I'm a sinful man, Jesus said, don't fear, Peter. From now on, you will be catching men. And so our recognition of God's infinite greatness is, is not just a time of reverence, but it's also a time of humility, of introspection, of acknowledgement of sin, repentance, and change, which leads to forgiveness. And God's, of course, mercy and grace for us. 
Worship is upward. Worship is inward. But third, worship also causes us to look outward. It causes us to then move into action to save and help those who are around us. Look at verse 8 of Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6 and verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, verse 9, Go and tell this people, Keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and repent and be healed. Worship enables us to see who we truly are, but also by the mercy of God, who we can be. And that is a person God wants us to be. Isaiah was greatly humbled by God, and he confessed his sin. Verse 7, God says, your sin is taken away. And then in verse 8, Isaiah was assured of God's forgiveness and that God would now use him in, in service to him. Isaiah was more than willing and said, Lord, here am I, send me. He now wanted to please the Lord. More than anything, Isaiah wanted to please the Lord. Isaiah worshiped God, and his worship led to greater reverence and understanding of himself and a desire to want to please the Lord. God said, go. And for the next 50 years, 50 years, Isaiah went teaching this message of salvation, repentance, and salvation. Brethren, worship that does not move us into action is worthless. It's worthless. As a part of my service of worship, verse 11, how long should I seek and save the lost? Look at verse 11. I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until cities are devastated and without inhabitant, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. And so in, in my outreach and how that worship has affected me, I need to do all that I can to save other people as long as I can. The message of God to Isaiah was, Isaiah, until there's nobody left. And so the message to us is as long as we possibly can. And so is our worship about us or is it about God? Yes. From our perspective, it's entirely about God. As Jesus said, you shall worship the Lord your God and you shall serve him alone. In Psalm 2, Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, lest he become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Worship is first and foremost about God. But from God's perspective, he knows our worship of him is also good for us. It stirs us to greater reverence for him. It humbles us. It awakens the need for repentance and forgiveness and transformation. And so we cry mercy, and God answers with mercy. It motivates us to be more like the object of our worship. Look with me at Psalm 115. Psalm 115. Psalm 115, beginning at verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to thy name give glory, because of thy loving kindness, because of thy truth. Why should the nation say, where now is their God? But our God is in the heavens 
He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, they cannot speak. They have eyes, they cannot see. They have ears, they cannot hear. Noses, they cannot smell. They have hands, they cannot feel. Feet, they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will become like them. Everyone who trusts in them. Psalm 115 is a sobering, sobering reminder that we eventually become like what we worship. And so we need to be very careful about two things. Number one, not give our heart to false idols of this world. And be careful that we're not lured into idolatry not just something of stone or metal or wood, but idols of the heart. Be careful we're not lured into idolatry. Take advantage of every occasion like this to worship God collectively, as well as in our families, as God would have us to. So we're reminded of the one true living God. And secondly, we must be careful to worship God as he truly reveals himself in the Bible through his son, Jesus Christ, and not in some way that is a false narrative taught by men. The only way to know God as he truly is, is to read his word as it's truly revealed, and then worship him as he truly reveals himself. In the end, the psalmist tells us all who worship falsely, all who worship falsely will be silenced. Look at verse 17. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any who go down into silence. But as for us, we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forever. Praise the Lord. And that kind of, of praise and honor spoken of by the psalmist, by Isaiah, when he said, here am I, Lord, send me, will result in an outreach of helping others to do the same. True worship begins and ends with a true recognition of God's infinite greatness and holiness. When we worship God as he teaches us to, we'll begin to see ourselves as we truly are, will grow in our reverence for God, the object or the person of our worship. And little by little, you and I will become more and more like our God as he wants us to be, his sons and his daughters. This is the plan and the purpose of God for us to be more and more like him each and every day. And worship is an essential part of that. And so, as we've sung the songs this morning and prayed this morning, and as we've urged this morning and admonished and encouraged in the lesson this morning, give your life to the Lord your God. Worship him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, for he is worthy. He alone is worthy. An old hymn says this, worthy of praise is Christ our Redeemer, worthy of glory and honor and power worthy of all our soul's adoration. Worthy art thou, worthy art thou. Where is your heart right now in relationship to God? Do these songs move you? Do the prayers stir you? Does God's word motivate you? Where are you? Did it used to do that? And it's not doing that now. If you're not as close to God as you used to be, who moved? Who moved? You moved away from God. It's up to you to come back to the Lord. Where are you in relationship to God? Where do you want to be? What do you need to do?
And we assist you in coming back to the Lord. He's ready to receive you. He's an awesome God, incomprehensible, glorious, full of mercy, full of grace. Would you come? He's ready to receive you as we stand and sing, please. Let's change the invitation song number 77. Just take out your book, 77, Worthy Art Thou.